All right, so we're going to move on to um, the last talk before we have the lunch break and more prizes, of course. So we're going to move on to Allison James. Allison was actually our keynote speaker last year at the Play Posium, which was amazing. If you weren't in attendance last year, we have her session recorded on our YouTube channel, so check that out for sure. Um, so she's back. We're happy about that. So Allison's been engaging in this very large research project um, about the value of play in higher education. I actually don't know what she's going to talk about today, so I'm pretty interested um, seeing what it is. So thank you, Allison. Thank you, Lisa. I never know what I'm going to talk about, so it's always a voyage of discovery for everybody. Um, and thank you so much for having me back. Um, I'm an absolute fan of the Playposium, and I think it's just incredible. I, in, in some respects, I feel asking the question, what is the value of play in higher education seems such a dumb question after, you know, the morning that we've had with these incredible examples of really exciting play in the chat and all the rest of it and the kind of theoretical heft that Pat has provided as well. So it's all been mind blowing. And in fact, when I looked at my, my talk title um, uh, earlier today, I just thought, God, that's really boring. So I thought, I'm not going to call it that. I'm going to call it answering the call. And I know that sounds a little bit kind of top gun, but really, I think, we are all here because we are in a tribe. We are in a tribe of play proponents. We believe in play, we're using play, or we want to learn more about play. So we are believers. Um, but we don't always find that everyone around us is a believer in the value of play in higher education. And whether we've wanted to or not, at some point or another, we might have found ourselves having to defend our use of play or playful approaches in a way that we've never had to do if we were doing lecture, seminar, group work, project work, experiential learning, whatever. And it's not that the value of play per se is disputed, but it's that people don't always get uh, its nature or its value or its place in higher education. They don't fully understand it. So this session is going to be a, an absolute kind of whiz, whiz through some stuff. And what I'd like to invite you to do is either sit back and listen because you're really tired and you're already hungry and you've got sneaky biscuits under the table. Or if you've got objects and you've got stuff nearby and you've got paper and pens and you want to kind of make it multi-sensory, then please do that too. If you read the blurb for my talk, I said, do bring along seven objects. If you saw that bit in the blurb, hooray. If you didn't see it, um, doesn't matter. Let's just let's just go with it. Free play, solo play, would have a bit of chat thrown in. So um, uh, as Lisa said, I've um, been at the Play Posium before. This is some of the work that I've done with play, creativity and imagination over the years. Um, all of it has formed a basis for the work that I have been doing with play over 12 years now, including as a Lego series play facilitator. And the book on the right hand side of your screen there, uh, The Power of Play in Higher Education, is one that I co-edited with my friend and colleague Christina Rancy. And we had 44 plus contributors um, across the globe. Well, in fact, we had 60 plus, but they ended up being 40 uh, examples of the way play was being used in higher education. That, that whole story is for another day, but it really underpins why I'm doing this project now. So I've spent two years gathering data. Uh, my um, activity has been very generously funded by this not-for-profit uh, charitable foundation, which is particularly interested in the intersection between the arts, sciences, imagination and play. But it is entirely open source. I don't benefit financially or commercially at all from this work. And my four aims have been this, uh, to continue my examination of play in every discipline, to pay particular attention because of my funders' interests on how play is being used for teaching management theories and concepts. And I found through my research already that there are such blurry lines between the disciplines. And we may start off thinking that you know, management play is likely to be all about uh, simulations and role plays and scenarios, but actually it's incredible how we all act like magpies and get ideas from everywhere else, as I wager we'll all be doing after today. And I've got a particular interest in perceptions of value, educator values, and also the value systems in which we operate that either make it really easy for us to be playful educators or actually quite difficult. 
And we've already, already had a big hurrah for Brian Sutton Smith in Pat's talk earlier today. And what uh, Sutton Smith did was distill 40 years of his own research into looking at play theory and how that turned into seven rhetorics or persuasive discourses, if you like, um, around the value and power of play. But what he didn't do was uh, consider higher education in any great detail. And so that's what I've been doing when I've been listening to my respondents. Um, as you can imagine, I was supposed to uh, be um, going to lots of places, doing lots of play workshops and lovely face-to-face -face stuff, and it didn't happen at all. I had to do surveys and lots of Zoom interviews, but they had a richness of their own. Predominantly, my respondents have been Western-centric, although to me this is of global interest. So, uh, as you can see from my slide, I've talked to lots of people in lots of countries, but I'm still happy to talk to lots of people in lots more countries or even the same countries. So if you haven't spoken to me and you want to, then please get in touch. And there are people in all kinds of roles, all kinds of hierarchies talking about play. And I'm also building on play theory, play literature, pedagogic literature, empirical and secondary sources. And so before we get into uh, answering the call, which is my kind of theme for the remainder of this session, I want to go back and give you a little bit more data on uh, Sutton Smith's seven rhetorics, um, because I want to, us to think about, are these relevant in higher education? Do we tap into them? Do we see them in the play experiences around us? And how useful are they and other expressions of value for when we are making the case for the value and legitimacy of playful pedagogy? So uh, if you did read the blurb, I said, bring along seven objects that uh, symbolize for you these um, seven things. If you did, hooray. If you've got them close by, hooray. Um, use them as you see fit. I believe that if you have an object close to you in your hands as you're, you're thinking about it, then it makes it more memorable. So these are the seven rhetorics. And um, those are my, my, seven, my seven objects. If you can see my face on the screen, one of the members of our family gave us a little bobblehead um, statue of ourselves. It is the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but it's wonderfully playful. So let's get into the rhetorics then. So progress, the rhetoric of progress is probably the one that makes the most sense in higher education as a whole. It's about um, rehearsal for the future. It's about mastery. It's about skills. It's about um, learning. And the funny thing is when um, Sutton Smith looked at the theory, he saw progress uh, largely delineated in regard to children's um, development and adaptation not to adults. And yet in universities, we're entirely interested in uh, adult development. Um, and so progress probably manifests itself in all kinds of forms of play, including the ones that we've already seen together, consolidating cognition, maybe escape rooms and games where you have to crack clues to be able to uh, get out of a place or move up a level, all forms of gamification, and many, many others. And so that's one very powerful rhetoric that says that actually progress is the reason why we play or why play is important. The next one is fate. And this might seem a little bit strange when we're thinking of life in universities, especially though, if we think about the last 20 months of the pandemic, we felt perhaps like we have been at the mercy of the fates, the gods, the gods an inconstant universe. Our fortunes have changed with the roll of a dice. Um, when Sutton Smith talks about uh, the role of fate, he also talks about magic or, alter, or altered consciousness. Now, altered consciousness might sound a bit dodgy when we're thinking about higher education, but actually one of my respondents used magic to teach business concepts. So we often, we've already seen, I think Pearl's uh, example of shoots and ladders, snouts and tails is a bit like a fate game, the roll of the dice, you know, have you managed to step forward? Are you stepping back? Variants of Monopoly card games and all sorts. Um, but it's not just the thrill of the roll of the dice. Educators use such games so that students can get to grips with sudden change, with dealing with the unknown, or perhaps the unfolding of a capricious situation. 
the rhetoric of play as power and all these rhetorics are distinct but sometimes they kind of meld together and this one probably has a lot to do with progress as well is about competitive play and representations of conflict and when I think of uh, forms of play that we use in universities, quite often we do have competitive play, uh, winners and losers, pitting teams of students one against the other. We've had lots of prizes today, which has been really exciting and incentivizing. Um, and it may seem superficially as though winning the prize is the point, but David's already shown us that actually the point is often pointless and the power of it is pointless. And educators in my study have said that while students may uh, superficially think that, that they've gained something through winning or losing, the actual activity has been about showing them that decision making is key to, uh, to their futures. It's key to how they handle un un uh, unanticipated consequences. It shows them when they need to speed up or slow down or act in the moment, or actually when they need to stop thinking about what they're doing and really focus on what the opponent is doing. So it's about skills, prowess, judgment, planning, lots of things that perhaps chime with higher education. Identity is really important and it occurs to me that perhaps we really mesh into this rhetoric today because we are all play proponents who are part of the playvolution. And it's all about identity, communal identity, traditional and community celebrations and festivals, things that bring us together uh, and connect us. So multiple cultures of play, which offer pleasure and identity and solidarity, team games and allegiances. So already this event is an important one, but also it taps into some of the research around belonging and connection that's been conducted more widely. And I would commend to you a report by Professor Lee Waller at Ashridge um, Business School, who has done a report on the sense of not belonging or belonging at work. And it's incredibly powerful what she has found about the effect on people when they feel they do belong or they don't belong. And respondents in my study have said time and again, play is all about making sure people know they belong and have a sense of connection. We often play in terms of the imaginary, the unreal or the fanciful or the visionary. We improvise, uh, we invert reality. Um, colleagues have talked to me about the fact that actually they'll invent fictional worlds or spaces. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ros Sunley at the University of Winchester invented an island called island of Laputare and this turned into a kind of digital online space where business and management students would go and explore um, concepts and activities and scenarios. The self is about our experiences of play, uh, the intrinsic satisfaction that we feel when we play. Again, going back to the 444, it doesn't matter if it doesn't mean anything else, how has it felt to us? And finally, the uh, notion of play as frivolity. Now, this is something we're really scared of in higher education, frivolous, useless, open-ended play, play with no purpose or meaning or goal. Um, and, yet, and yet, how do we question our assumptions if we don't allow for this kind of frivolousness or this nonsense or this unending of norms? Otherwise, we'll always accept what we've always had. So these are very crude summaries of the rhetoric, but they give you a sense of the value systems and beliefs. And what I'd just like you to do super quick in the chat perhaps is just let me know, do any of these outlines of rhetorics or play practices chime at all with the way you use play or you've had play used around you, with you, or that you're aware of? I'm calling in so I can't put anything in the chat, but I'm happy to respond. Yeah, if you'd like to very quickly, that's lovely. I'm combining trauma healing and ungrading in play as a way to increase a sense of belonging and it seems to be working well. That is a really lovely, um, really lovely example. Can you say your name? Because I'm afraid I can't see my gallery terribly well. Sure, my name is Rachel Goldberg. Rachel, that was great. Thank you so much. You. And so, so keep keep your, your thoughts coming in the chat, but I'll move on anyway, because I know you probably all really want your lunch. Um, 
David, I noticed, talked about uh, us being stuck on progress. Yes, I think we are. And yes, yet I had military educators saying to me, I'm never going to say to a three star general, I'm playing. But hell, that's exactly what we do in the army. And we really do need frivolity and things to upend our thinking. You can tell my study is anonymous, can't you? So let's go to answering the call. How are we going to answer the call? And what is the call calling us to? Well, it's calling us to the grand court of educational legitimacy. And we, this isn't, by the way, the grand court of educational legitimacy. This is a, a picture of a court that I've nicked off Wikipedia. Um, and lots of times we don't feel that we're called to justify our actions, but perhaps we are on occasion. And if we are called to this court, who are we gonna go as? Are we going to advocate as ourselves? Or are we going to choose or channel an alter ego, a superhero, your Auntie Beryl, whoever? Put some ideas in the chat about how will you advocate for the value and the power of play? And while you're thinking about who your advocates might be, let's go on and think else. What else are we going to need if we're going to be marshalling our resources to make this advocacy? Well, anybody who's going to go on a trip or an expedition or an adventure needs a jolly good bag. And obviously we're going to put all sorts of things in this bag that we're going to need. And now obviously if you just wanna shove in snacks and drinks, that's completely fine, they're really important. But what about provisions? What kinds of provisions might we, might we need? And when I think of provisions, perhaps I think of the kinds of play practices that we want to share. So these are some of the big categories of play that I've come across in my study. And some of them will be very familiar to you. Simulations, role plays, board games, we've talked about them. And some perhaps uh, a less well used nonsense or disorienting play, disorienting play, embodied play, remembering that solo play is just as important as collaborative or group play, use of maggots. Mag it's true. I had a colleague in forensic science who did a parody of Formula One called Maggot Racing to teach about decomposition, magic tricks, virtual reality. There's going to be lots more detail in the re uh, research when I publish it. But these are just some of the examples of the play that we might want to have in our bag of provisions. And on the right hand side of the screen, we've got other provisions that we might want in this bag. And these are the, the perceptions of value or the benefits. And we've already seen that people are using play not just as an alternative to play, but to enable people to grasp difficult subjects or deal with the big existential questions in life. Yes, for fun, enjoyment, relaxation and bonding, but also for opening the mind. And also in our bag, we've probably got our beliefs. And one of the questions I asked our respondents was, what are your values um, as an educator and how do they fit in with your play practices? And these were just a few of the things that they cited about being trustworthy and ethical, fostering agency and empowerment, wanting students to see them as responsive, approachable, knowledgeable, but also challenging and inspiring their students. Sadly, at least one of my respondents, and there were several more said, my students have had a love of learning kicked out of them at school. What an indictment of some of the models that we're using when we're not using play. And others have said, I remember what a struggle it was to learn, and I don't want any of my students to be left behind. Now, one of the things that I did find also when I matched these perceptions of value and uh, a sense of our values was there's a real fit between the, the benefits of play and why we play, but also what it says about us and our educator identity and the commitment that we have to our educational practice and to our students. Now, we've got all our provisions so far and probably we're also gonna need a map in our bag. And, and often when we have maps, we kind of know a bit of the territory, but maybe we need to add in um, or uh, some, some resources or some points of reference. 
um, and maybe there's whole swathes of uncharted territory. So we might have a sense that there will be watering holes, there will be friendly stopping points, there will be people we can turn to, but, but we also know there will be bears, there will be dark spots, and it's about how we navigate the terrain. And these are just a few of our little points of reference. So there we are in our bag. We've got practices, benefits, values, beliefs, knowledge of the terrain. Pop in the chat so that you can see it. Anything else that you feel you want in the bag. And while you're adding those thoughts of what you might like in your bag, thinking about the fact that we are going to encounter not just the value systems um, that, that we're familiar with and that, that drive us, but we're going to perhaps encounter and be supported by or butt up against value systems that may actually not support what we want to do. So uh, is an institutional value all about value for money? Is it all about believing that exams are the only fair way of assessing students? What about the disciplinary values? Does my use of play totally fit with my disciplinary interests or does it actually contradict them? A lot of my respondents said, I think I'm unusual in my disciplinary field. What about educational cultures? What about national cultures and values? What about state policy? We have, for example, uh, state policy in the UK, which is remarkably denigratory about higher education in general, never mind playful pedagogy. And what are the others that might come into play? And again, as you're thinking about your map, your territory, your provisions, your case, perhaps you're also thinking or jotting down the value systems that you come across. And again, my invitation to you, share in the chat, have you, have you got supportive value systems you encounter or have you found conflicting ones? And of course, there are lots of little pointy arrows all over um, and there could be many, many more, but they just made it look a, a stupendous mess. And this was something that one of my respondents in my study said, and he said, sometimes I think my values as an educator don't fit the values of the HE business these days because my job is preparing students for inhabiting a future then. And you may look at that and think, well, yeah, that's, that's what my university says. That's what we're all about. What's wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with it, but there are limitations to it. And his point was, it's not what I want. And we've heard this already today. I want students to be the architects of what they think a transformative education is, of what they think their goals are, of what they think a successful degree is for them, not what my institution believes because it will fit the employability metrics or it will move them up the rankings. And so I felt that was a really powerful point. And it also points to that kind of split in the discourse where actually it sounds like education is talking the talk and our institutions are talking the talk, but actually perhaps Perhaps we don't, perhaps we've got that, that competing or underlying or contradictory discourse going on that actually we as educators find quite difficult to navigate. So here uh, at the end of my sort of canter, we have um, what I'm offering as a kind of, I don't know, you can call it what you like really, um, a scenario, a strategy, uh, a, a network, a plan, a model, a tea towel, uh, 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 whatever, whatever you want to call it. And, um, but it's really about thinking, does this as a kind of knitting together of the different forms of value help us when we want to or need to or be, are being called to make a case for the value of play? Can we harness the rhetorics to support that case? And do please put some um, comments in the chat, yay or nay, um, about, about such, such a thought. And I am conscious that, that this has all been thrown at you super, super fast. And can this kind of configuration of value help us um, convince others? Can this be our persuasive discourse? And perhaps most importantly, what is missing? Is there anything that you really feel about the value and the importance of play or, or that you feel that you need to get across to others that can't be allied into 
the forms of value or value systems that I've, I've skated over so fast or can't be tucked in to any of the rhetorics that Sutton Smith has, um, has come up with. Now we have a few minutes, so it is very much a starter for 10, very much a big conversation to be continued. If you would like to continue it and talk to me, this is how you can find me. Um, I'm at uh, Alison R. James on Twitter. I'm a bit rubbish on Twitter, but if you tweet, I will find you. Or my email is engagingimagination.com at gmail.com. Or where my website is https forward slash forward slash engagingimagination.com. I'll leave that slide there, but I'll go to uh, the chat. And perhaps in the last five minutes, um, I don't know, uh, David or Lisa, if, if, you, if you've seen any questions that you want to pull out um, so that we can have a few questions before everybody goes to lunch. I haven't seen any questions, just some really amazing ideas of using play in classrooms. Um, we can open it up, though, if anyone has questions for Allison. I think Kian has a, a really interesting point there. If you want to pull that out, Allison, or, or maybe come on yeah, stage and- I can see it. I can, Kian, I can see it. Thank you. And Kian's question, I worry that positioning pedagogical play in a series of rhetorics to ju justify its use to administrators ad presupposes a degree of job security most educators no longer have. Very powerful question there. Um, Kian, I would say, and I've just asked a question because there was another point. Um, it's not about convincing administrators sometimes, it's about convincing students. Um, and I know I put up the grand court of educational legitimacy, but what I found sometimes is actually, it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of time people might say to me, oh, you know, it's the lead, the leadership is the problem, they don't get it. That may be true, but sometimes it is not the leaders necessarily, the leaders are okay, but it's the students who are paying a huge amount of money for their studies or it is about their parents who are behind the students who are worried about the validity of what they're doing. It might be, you know, people's influences might be no proper, proper academic um, education is this, it's that, it's the other. So I guess what I'm suggesting, whether we use rhetorics or whether we use other points, it's about helping people who don't understand about pedagogical play to realize that it's not about messing around with somebody's time. It's about uh, helping people understand that actually the deepest, most effective, most powerful, most memorable learning can happen through play. Um, Kian, I don't know if I've done an adequate answer to your very important point. And I do think your point about job security is, is, is absolutely right. Um, but it's not just play that will threaten our job security. It's unfortunately a lot of other things as well. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. That, that is uh, excellent answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Any other? Any other thoughts? I've seen. I've seen a lovely, a lovely thing about the story engine deck. There are loads of um, card games. Um, uh, out there available. Um, oh gosh, Brian Eno came out with his oblique strategies many years ago as kind of off the wall prompts. Um, so many, so many different forms of play, lots of words about uh, LARPs and Dungeons and Dragons again. So Dungeons and Dragons, a guy called Professor Ian Turner has, has used those super effectively in play. I've got lots of colleagues who are using LARPs so Alison, I, it's a comment I made. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about it. You talk about the the, the frameworks, sort of a justification and, and understand play. I'm interested to hear you talk about how you could use the rhetorics as a design language to maybe break out of some of the, the, the approaches. So for example, when you talk about oblique strategies or cards, those are really fate-based kind of play, but we yeah. don't think about it that way. No. No, we don't. And I think the way to do that, and by the way, I'm I'm sharing the rhetorics um, in a spirit of critical inquiry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not wholeheartedly selling them to you because, of course, they were elicited for play theory rather than our play practice. But I am very interested in the synergies between them and where they appear in higher education. But I think what I'm finding, and I've just 
put my toe in the water here today is that that yes we can come across no end of examples of fateful play um we can come across no end and um of examples i think you yourself noted david of, of players progress players power actually if you think of the kind of the political scary dark side of life in in universities um, the power dynamic in a university, whether actually we're talking about curriculum or we're talking about student staff interrelations or as Kian has actually acknowledged the, the power dynamics between different staff, uh, different members of the university community, that's actually a very serious, very dark, unfunny, unlighthearted uh, presence of play. The interesting thing about play, I think, which uh, which I think it would be nice to triangulate and, and, and I haven't done it yet, but thank you for the idea, David, is lots of people have talked about play as, as, as having great correlations with design thinking. And, and so maybe there is a triangulation to do uh, between design thinking and play and the rhetorics. Um, I guess one of the questions in my head that I'm really interested in is, you know, is, is anything in, in higher education, because higher education is a multitude of disciplines, it's not a single discipline, is are the rhetorics enough or is there another rhetoric that we need for higher education? Um, are there actually negative rhetorics that we come across? But again, that's a, a conversation for another day. And I guess when I talk about justification, I'm talking about justification when we need to make it. I think the wonderful thing of a community like this and about other play communities that we may belong to is that actually, you know, you don't need to explain yourself. People get it. Uh, people are naturally fired up. You don't have the people saying, oh, but don't bring Play-Doh because my students won't like it when they haven't even asked their students. Um, slightly rambly answer. David, did I sort of answer your question or point? Yeah, I just, I, I was just curious to hear your thoughts, but it's a big it's a big frontier isn't it it's it's a huge frontier and and what i've touched on today number one it, you were all guinea pigs because it's 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 a prototyping of actually something that's that's um, going to be a day workshop so um it was it was a completely ridiculous notion on my part to to attempt to attempt it in 30 minutes but i'm hoping that even in 30 minutes there have been some kinds of stimuli and thoughts in there um, around play and if anybody's interested in 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 um in uh, being able to access the, the research when it's finally written up and i'm writing it up at the moment it's a very slow job then i'm i'm very very happy to share like pat very happy to talk to anybody outside um outside this event about play in the the end really <laughs>